Our next speaker is Dava Kila with a talk titled Towards Language Models That Can See Computer Vision Through the Lens of Natural Language. So another yet another modality, and we'll see how reasoning with language models can help us solve computer vision tasks. Uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you, you can hear me, right? Pablos, can I get a thumbs up? Yes, all right. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks very much for inviting me. I'm very sorry I can't be there in person. So uh, good morning from California. Uh, um, I'll try to get, be there next time, but uh, I've just started a, a new company uh, called Contextual AI, and, and so my my attention is needed here. I couldn't really just fly over to Amsterdam, even if I wanted to. Um, so I, I'll keep my talk on the shorter side here, uh, because I think we're over time a little bit, and there are like uh, drinks and things coming up where I, I can't be, so I'll try to leave some time for questions and discussion in the end. Um, so... Uh, there are a couple of incredible speakers uh, on the roster of this workshop. I, I just heard uh, Niels, I think uh, he talked about Reg, and uh, I saw some some talks about like language models in production and all kinds of uh, research topics that are very close to my heart, uh, but they're already very well covered. So I, I thought for my talk, I would talk about something a bit more out there. Uh, so this is a, a fun research paper we did uh, with our team uh, called Lens, where we are trying to make language models see so the, the the starting point for this this work is really just the idea of like okay you have a language model uh, what would happen if you gave it a set of eyes um, uh, can you then do more interesting things and, and how good is that actually as a baseline if you compare it to other existing multimodal models um, and and so this this idea really fits in into this bigger trend. Uh, that you're probably aware of where we're trying to augment language models. So retrieval augmented generation is a type of augmentation that we're doing there with the retriever, but you can augment it in all kinds of different ways, right? So like tool former, if you want to handle tables, for example, uh, there, there are different ways you can do that. And, and what we're interested in here is, can you do this for computer vision? And so as a natural language processing person, I really personally like the idea of turning as much of computer vision as possible into a natural language processing problem um, and then seeing how far you can get with that. So th this has some really nice properties uh, around modularity, uh, which I think make it really worth investigating. So you can recycle modules when new language models come out. So if we switch from Llama to Llama 2 to Llama 3, then you can just recycle exactly the same uh, pattern. You don't have to do anything special there. Um, and uh, so there's there's this idea of pre-training on, on multimodal data, which is actually pretty time consuming. And if you just keep everything modular, then you don't have to waste time on that. So uh, it has a lot of potential if you can just do augmentation rather than multimodal pre-training. So just very briefly, um, why multimodality actually matters. I, I think there are lots of very good reasons. Um, so faithfulness is one, right? Human experience is very multimodal. We uh, are, are not just consuming text as, as human beings, we are consuming the world and, and that's how we experience uh, reality through multimodality. Uh, the internet, many, many other practical applications, everything is multimodal, like uh, uh, tabular data is, is multimodal as well. So uh, those are kind of like the standard arguments, right? But there, there's this, this other way of looking at it around the, the perspective of data efficiency and data availability. So multimodal data is much richer, or in the in the words of uh, Jan LeCun, much more high bandwidth uh, than text, which is sort of an imperfect, incomplete, low bandwidth serialization protocol, according to Jan. Uh, so th that's a bit dismissive of language, I think, but but the general gist, I think, is is valid that multimodal data, especially if it's multimodal data of the same underlying uh, structure, uh, is very valuable as a learning signal. And the other argument is, is that uh, we need more data. We're running out of high quality text data. Uh, so if we can use more data and there's a lot of multimodal data on the internet, then that will allow us to scale much further. So for, for these reasons, I think if you look at the, the kind of trends at the real frontier of foundation models, uh, you'll see that multimodality really is one of the, the big topics. So uh, I've been interested in this problem for a very long time, and, and I was very frustrated with how we actually check that our multimodal systems are actually multimodal. So we designed this challenge uh, at Facebook called the Hateful Memes Challenge, where we uh, are, are really trying to be very precise about measuring whether systems can do multimodal reasoning and understanding. 
so these are not examples from the actual data set. Uh, you might have heard of, of the, the data set itself, but so these are mean meme examples because the actual data set contains real hateful examples that, which you don't want to put on a slide. Um, but so here's an example, right? So if you send this to a friend, that's not very nice. Um, uh, so love the way you smell today with the skunk. But if you swap out the image, so just one single modality, now it's a nice thing to uh, send to somebody. Or if you just swap out the text and you change one word, love the way skunks smell, now it's also harmless, right? So you can make very subtle changes to one single modality um, and they, they radically alter the correct label for the, the mean. Um, so if you can classify all three of these correctly, you need to have a pretty good multimodal uh, reasoning and understanding capability. So when we announced this data set, uh, we were hoping to see a big difference between multimodal pre-training and unimodal pre-training. So the, the basic argument would be if you uh, really train jointly across these two modalities, then you're going to get a system that is much more capable uh, in terms of reasoning and understanding over these different modalities. So to our uh, disappointment, what we actually found is that there's a very, very small gap between uh, unimodal pre-training and multimodal pre-training. Uh, so uh, I, I uh, was very disappointed that, that this happened because, uh, yeah, it just meant that multimodal pre-training didn't really work. So this was a couple of years ago. Uh, so maybe things are better now. Uh, so we introduced this other data set called Winnow Ground, um, where uh, we were trying to uh, uh, classify examples like this correctly. So some plants surrounding a light bulb or a light bulb surrounding some plants. These are actually all ex exactly the same words, but just in a different order, and they have very different images. So to a human, this is basically a, a trivial problem, right? Um, and guess what? Uh, if you uh, take the state-of-the-art vision and language uh, systems and you ask them to solve this problem, they perform worse than chance. So again, that means that multimodal pre-training so far doesn't really necessarily work, unfortunately. Um, so, so that's kind of where we're coming from. And, and if you look at the, the larger trends in this idea of multimodal pre-training, you can actually see that over time, components are becoming more and more frozen. Uh, so I think that's a very interesting development because a lot of the, the models that I showed in the previous tables on hateful memes and winter ground, they tend to be of this kind where everything is completely uh, jointly optimized. Everything is trained from scratch and it's real multimodal pre-training. So this is kind of old style. So there's this paper from DeepMind called Flamingo where a bunch of the different components are frozen. So the only thing that's learned is this kind of perceiver that learns to aggregate across, across different images or different image chunks. And then you have a cross attention layer across the language model blocks. Um, and so this idea was taken even further to the extreme by Blip2 where they have this image encoder and there's only this small kind of projection layer almost between the image encoder and the frozen language model. So what we're doing here with Lens is basically taking that idea to the extreme. What if I just freeze everything? What if I just take the visual descriptors? I have this kind of computer vision pipeline. It spits out objects, captions, attributes, and I just get, give that to a frozen language model. And then uh, I ask the language model, what's the dog doing? And it can just reason about this. So this is a pretty strong baseline, as you'll see. Um, but it shouldn't really be, right? Because there, there's really no multimodal pre-training at all going on here. There are zero updatable multimodal pre-training parameters in this architecture. Um, so so what the, what we then end up doing, uh, just to, to uh, kind of go over the components of the system in a bit more detail. Uh, so we're just turning the computer vision modules here into their natural language outputs. So we have some tags for this image of like surfing, surfer, dog, water dog, um, and then some attributes uh, using an attribute model, and then uh, some captions using a, a rich captioning model. Um, so we give this as a prompt to the language model, then we ask it the question, um, and then the language model gives you uh, very often the right answer. So uh, the, the different components that you're using here are, are really just off the shelf uh, uh, computer vision parts. So uh, many of you are probably familiar with Clip from OpenAI from a few years back, where you have this text encoder and an image encoder, and you just uh, uh, basically do contrastive learning over the pairs and make sure that you rank the correct pair the highest. And this allows you to uh, generalize even in the zero shot case uh, to new photos and, and new captions. 
So that gives you a, a very rich system where you can uh, try uh, different new tags and it will generalize to them on the fly as well. Um, and then on the rich captioning side, uh, we use this model called Blip, uh, which is also kind of a, a very straightforward uh, model that uh, has like a, a image text ma matching loss and, and a kind of generative component so that it can generate these relatively rich uh, image captions. So if you take the outputs of, of those systems and then you pump them through a frozen language model for a task like um, um, computer vision classification, then you can just take whatever the label is that, that you should be classifying um, and, and then uh, just basically turn that into a probability distribution and that gives you uh, a prediction for the classification task. So um, how well does that do? Um, so it turns out that if you compare that to CLIP, it actually does surprisingly well. So CLIP is what, so this is across all the different CLIP tasks. Um, and if you uh, give the, uh, the, those tasks to this particular pipeline, uh, if you do a, a couple of sort of a, a few short instructions, if you include those in the prompt, then you can get the system to be quite a lot better than just your, your regular computer vision pipeline. So this really is a, is a powerful idea. And again, there's no training at all here, right? It's just uh, uh, putting things together. So uh, you can apply the same idea to uh, kind of the canonical benchmark for a lot of these multimodal and, and uh, vision and language problems, which is visual question answering. Um, and again, you can turn that into a uh, probability distribution over the answers. Um, and if you do that, then you get a very competitive zero shot performance with completely no training. So this this to me was actually very surprising and uh, I, I hope it is very surprising to you too. Uh, so th these are big famous models. They made a lot of noise, right? I don't know if you remember when Cosmos came out or like Flamingo uh, was a big deal when DeepMind announced it or Blip2 from Salesforce. So these are models with, with sometimes really huge numbers of trainable parameters where a lot of compute has been invested in, into uh, uh, showing multimodal examples to the model where you have an aligned image and text pair and things like that. Uh, but if you look at the numbers, then, then that approach doesn't actually seem to work all that well. Uh, so this is Flamingo, 80 billion parameters, 10.2 billion trainable parameters in terms of the cross attention and the perceiver modules. Uh, but this lens model, uh, with zero trainable parameters actually beats it. Um, and similar on okay, VQA on SST, uh, 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 so rendering SST as images, uh, it does much better. And then on hateful memes, it outperforms all of these other Flamingo models. Um, so so I think this is, is a quite surprising result. And, and uh, it basically means that maybe we have to go back to, to the drawing board when it comes to how we deal with multimodality uh, and pre-training in these big foundation models. So uh, here are some, some nice examples of the kind of things that, that you can do with this um, uh, system. So uh, you can upload pictures and then uh, it will turn those pictures into text uh, behind the scenes, right? And then you can uh, say something like, tell me something about the history of this place. And it has already figured out what this place actually is and it will tell you a story and you can have a conversation about this image. So this ha has a lot of potential. And, and so as you can see, it, it even deals with these winter ground images I showed earlier, uh, or, or like unusual situations with an upside down house or like the Stroop test effect where, where uh, it mixes up the actual uh, sort of letters and, and the color uh, that it spells out. Um, so this is pretty impressive, and we could have just shown you only the, the cherry-picked examples, uh, but the, that's not really our style. Uh, so the interesting thing about Flamingo, which was never released, right, um, is that uh, this system beats the big Flamingo on VQA, but it's still actually just frankly pretty terrible at a lot of stuff. Uh, so I, I think, um, uh, yeah. That that's not not uh, making Flamingo look very well. If this system is is performing better than it, I can see why they didn't release a demo. Basically, um, but uh, so if you have uh, like a picture of this and then you ask unrelated questions, then it really starts hallucinating. It doesn't really remember previous images or a lot of conversational history. Uh, sometimes there's just stuff going on in the image that isn't really spotted by the computer vision pipeline, and then the language model has no way of solving it. 
uh, there's inconsistencies. Uh, so yeah, there's still even here. Uh, there, there's a there's a lot of work to be done uh, just in making this particular uh, thing better. So if you want to play with this, uh, there's a research demo online. Uh, so it's a research demo, right? It's not polished in any way. You can just uh, uh, try playing with it um, and and see how well the system does. Uh, it supports three different language models, so you can do Flan T5 or Open Assistant or ChatGPT, and then see how well these language models can. Uh, deal with images if you give them a set of eyes. Um, so uh, where we are going, I, I thought it would be interesting to kind of end end my uh, very quick talk uh, on a note of sort of a, a future outlook. Um, so I think uh, my prediction would be that the next generation of language models is basically all going to be multimodal, right? So there's, there's a lot of trends. GPT-4 is, is already supposed to be multimodal, even though we haven't really seen it yet. And, and I think if you talk to all the people in, in Google or Meta or other places where they're building big uh, models, uh, all of them are working very uh, aggressively on solving this problem of multimodality. So I think um, there's, there's a lot uh, going to happen in the next, uh, let's say, year or two uh, in this space. And there's already some some very cool work, uh, even in the open source uh, community, from uh, my uh, friends at Hugging Face, former colleagues, uh, Edifix and Obelix, a uh, very nice name where where they uh, uh, basically trained another kind of flamingo uh, replica, but then open source, and, and that's released as well. So you can play with that. And interestingly, this lens system also still beats Edifix. Uh, so there's, there's still work to be done. Um, and uh, so one thing that I, I just briefly wanted to kind of point out, also given sort of the audience here and, and the organizers and, and the previous talk uh, uh, on the roster, is that uh, one interesting possibility with this lens mechanism as well, but just in general, I think, is to uh, build these retrieval augmented language models and then to make those multimodal. So we actually have a paper uh, from uh, a long time ago by now, uh, before retrieval augmentation was cool and before multimodality was cool. Uh, called cross-modal retrieval augmentation for multimodal classification, where we basically do exactly this already. So we have this vector database style face index. Uh, we have different encoders. Uh, we allow you to do retrieval over that, and then you have a multimodal model that makes predictions. So at the time, this model uh, scored very high on, on the, the VQA uh, data set uh, uh, that people were using at the time. So uh, I think there's a lot of potential for revisiting these kinds of ideas uh, uh, for for really building the next generation of models. Um, so yeah, uh, to, to kind of sum it up, I think multimodality holds a lot of promise. Uh, we are not going to be running out of data if we include all this multimodal data. Um, it gives us a much richer understanding of the human world. Uh, and so that will really make AI better and, and more aligned with humans if it really understands how humans experience the world. So I think that's just important uh, in, in principle. And then in practice, uh, as you saw in Madelon's uh, talk as well, there's just a lot of like tables and charts and online content and interactive content and all of that uh, you want to be able to deal with in your language model applications or in your general uh, AI applications. So uh, uh, in practice, that's just a problem that we, we have to solve uh, if we want to unlock the next set of use cases and applications. Um, yeah, so uh, that that was it. Uh, all credit for the work goes to the authors. I'm basically just the, the conduit here telling you about it. Uh, so thank you for listening. Any questions? Thanks a lot. This was a really captivating talk, and I don't know if I could have done it at 7 a.m. here. So thanks again for being with us. Yeah. Uh, question from the, questions from the audience? Hi, and thanks for the talk. Um, my question, what's your view on why these multimodal transformers, why do they not work? What's broken? Why? Uh, what's lacking? Is it the setup? Is it the loss? Is it the data? And should we even care? Or is it just uh, let's go for the big black hole LLMs and shove everything in and it will solve it all? Yeah, good question. I, I wish I knew the answer because then I would have fixed it already. Um, so, um, uh, I, yeah, there, there are, I think, a couple of interesting possibilities. I, I think uh, the, the properties of the problem make it look like probably scale is going to be one of the things that could make this work much better. 
Um, so, so if you look at all the efforts that are going on um, in these big labs with lots of compute resources, they're really uh, training on huge multimodal data sets. And I think if you start doing that and then you put the appropriate kind of information bottlenecks inside your network architecture, uh, then you hopefully kind of compress all the, the really relevant information into the same, uh, the, the same uh, network, essentially. And if, if you can do that successfully and you get alignment between the different concepts and different modalities, uh, then it can work. But uh, yeah, so just doing that on, on the relatively small data sets that people have been using and the relatively small scales, uh, that, that's kind of uh, uh, one of the, the big problems, right? Okay, thanks. We can do one more quick question uh, so we don't need too much into the break. Hi, so thank you for your talk, uh, firstly. Um, given that uh, your main finding basically is that keeping everything frozen works pretty well, <clears throat> uh, what do you think is next? What's next for your research? Yeah, so so I, I guess you're asking about sort of what we're building at Contextual uh, as well. So um, what, what we are looking at is something uh, very close to this architecture, basically, right? So uh, I think multimodality and retrieval augmentation are, are really the big topics. And if you can solve both of those at the same time, then you can uh, get much richer language models that can do a lot more. Uh, so so um, like you said, we've shown here that if you have a frozen system, you can do really well. Um, and uh, um, uh, so now the question is, how do you unfreeze it so that you can end-to-end -end optimize the entire system and do even better? Uh, so we're pursuing that idea in multiple multimodal land, but uh, also just in general, where this idea of retrieval augmented generation um, also has frozen components, basically. Right? So it's sort of like a Frankenstein's monster where you have this frozen vector database with a frozen embedder with a frozen language model. Um, and, and we think you can do much better if you actually optimize that system. 